Are you tight? Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Yes. Um, I'm in Seattle, Washington at this point. Oh. Uh, I'm a professor at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma. Uh, and uh, at this point, I'm a, a professor of maritime. Wow. Uh, my area is clinical community. And uh, yeah, that's me. Oh, great. What's your, yeah. you ask, what's your area? What, uh, my area is clinical and community uh, sort of together. Uh, so community, I'm interested in prevention and systems. And uh, clinically, I was a general practitioner. I held a, a, a license, psychology license for a number of years. But um, that's also been retired. Right? <laughs> right. Right, right. And how about how? you? Oh, yeah. I'm curious yeah. as to you, Sally. Oh, so I am, I'm from Montclair State University. I'm an assistant oh. in, uh, in New Jersey. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, do, are you familiar with it? Uh, I think there was a biennial conference there in community psych about yeah. four to six years ago. Oh. Yeah, 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 I think so. Okay, that might have been, that might have predated me a little bit. This is actually oh. my fourth year. Oh. Um, and so I'm in school psychology. Oh. Uh. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm in fourth year and loving it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay, so this is really cool. So we have some people who are, um, we're like just one spanning the nation. So uh, yeah, I'm yeah, also that's in New good. Mexico. <laughs> so that's amazing. Um, yeah. But then also just spanning like level of expertise. So it sounds like Sally, you're almost can still considered an ECP um, versus John is like very happily retired, it seems like, which I'm ready for, right. but I'm so right. stupid. Uh, so I thought that we um, could kind of merge you together and really talk about for students like either like some tips and tricks but more so mentoring um, and so I'm wondering you know like given where you are now and kind of your process um, how did you both start out so like what like where did you know that okay I'm gonna be a psychologist mm. No, oh. uh, a, a good question. Uh, and Sally, I, I defer to you on this to begin with, but but I was wondering if you could fill us in a little bit about yourself. Oh so, yeah, really, you're three. Yeah. You're three. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so we'll start there. So uh, my name is Jason Daniel. I am the Division Forty Five Student Representative. Um, this is my third year in this position. Um, but as Sally and I were talking about, I'm actually a counselor education, um, and so I'm in a second year doctoral program. Um, currently doing clinical work with African American college students, which is kind of my research focus um, and also my clinical focus. Um, and I have a deep passion for students as a whole. Um, and so that's really what founded this virtual mentorship program um, and kind of why we've expanded it so much over this last year because it's just been so helpful to meet people in different disciplines um, and kind of figure out like what you really want to do um, when you're in grad school, but then even after grad school. Where are you again with the university? I'm at University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Oh, that, that, sorry. Right. Yeah, remember. okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, so down here in the Southwest, it's nice and 75 today, so I'm, I'm ready for spring. Enjoying <laughs> that part. Sorry, Sally. I'm sure it's like snowing or something crazy. On the East Coast. Yeah, it's pretty cold. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Oh. Right. So thanks. Of course. It's, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us and taking the time in your schedule to talk to students. I really appreciate it. Sure. sure. But I'll defer to Sally. Do you want to start on how you entered psychology? Sure. Uh, I'll have to. Sure. So actually, it's a little bit of a funny story because I originally was intending to be a biology teacher when I first started oh. college. And my first semester, I accidentally walked into a psychology class and decided to stay because it looked really interesting. Um, and so I actually started out as a cognitive science major and then eventually uh, decided once I took some education-related classes that I wanted to look at the intersection of psychology and education. 
And oh, so awesome. I ended up switching over to psychology and then deciding to pursue a school psych graduate program. Yeah. Um, and I would say I became really interested in research probably around my second or third year in undergrad when I started getting involved in some more cognitive science labs and then doing an honors thesis. And then eventually I knew I wanted to be in academia. And so I was looking for programs that allow me to be an academic school psychologist. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> right. Awesome. Where did you get your degree? What? Well, since you're newer a PhD, where did you get your degree? I'm sort of curious. I got my degree at the University of Florida. Florida, got yeah. it. Yeah, okay. so I, I had a taste of the good weather. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and unfortunately, I had to give it up. We don't, we don't have beaches in New Mexico, so <laughs> <laughs> you, you were winning. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I come from good weather as well. My undergraduate degree is at Univ from the University of Hawaii, mm. so we do well that way. Yeah. <clears throat> and my start was uh, uh, really I was in seminary at the oh. time and interested in becoming a priest. Uh, and a psychiatrist came through and started talking about how to think of dealing with human problems from a scientific point of view. And I liked that. So I went on to psychology as an undergrad and then on to, to uh, graduate studies. And I, I went uh, the opposite end of Florida. I went to the University of Rochester in wow. upstate New York. So I understand snow. It's a huge difference. It's, yeah, it's huge difference. <laughs> right, 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 right. But it was, uh, it was a good one. It was a good move. That's awesome. So um, it sounded like, in a sense, you kind of walked upon psychology, or like really psychology found you. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering, like, why did you choose your specialization? So like, why clinical or like, why school? <laughs> John, would you like to answer that? Or? Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, clinical because you dealt with people. And uh, at least from my undergraduate experience, clinical was a way to go if you wanted to work uh, specifically with people uh, and their problems. Uh, the community part came when I went to Rochester, which was um, known for having uh, community orientation as well as a clinical program and so uh, my uh, one of my professors uh, was uh, a fellow named Emery Cowan who worked in schools so I was thinking oh. of Sally who worked in schools and early detection and prevention programs and uh, from uh, those connections with Emery and with the uh, another advisor, Ralph Barocas, <clears throat> I got into community. And so a lot of our graduates went on to uh, be leading researchers and practitioners in community, and, and I got involved. Awesome. Right. So tell me. Yeah, I would say um, I, I always knew, at least starting in my around my junior or senior year, that I was really interested in the intersection of psychology and education. And mm -hmm. so psychology seemed like an excellent fit. And then I would say also that I really wanted to work with children. And so I wanted a degree that would allow me to develop some clinical skills mm -hmm. so that I could actually practice if I wanted to, and then also to stay connected to the research so that it was really keeping my options open in terms of staying connected to the um, K to 12 population, but then also being able to develop some research interests as well. Hmm. And so on the other sense, and I'm kind of going to flip it on you guys a little bit. So what is one thing you would tell your younger self about going into academia or like the professorate? Hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> That's a really, really good question. Right. Um, you mean our undergrad selves or our early doctoral selves? Either or. Okay. Um, I would say really in, invest in yourself in the sense that you want to spend time developing skills, particularly um, 
skills in statistical analysis and skills in research design and things like that. Um, get your hands in as many research projects as you can, as many opportunities as you can. Um, the broader your array of expertise and your competencies, the more you'll be able to do in your own research. And then even in terms of participating on editorial boards and reviewing other research, um, really diversity of experience is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I like her advice. That's <laughs> <laughs> John, uh, I'm not going to let you off the hook, baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As, an, <laughs> as an undergrad, I, um, similar things, stay active. I, uh, I TA'd and RA'd for a variety of folks as an undergrad and presented. Uh, um, and all of those were, I think, helpful. Uh, as well, there were opportunities to be a student leader, and I think that may have been, had some appeal to my graduate program. Um, so uh, stay active, but, but uh, be balanced about it. Uh, I also know of folks who sort of burned out along the way. Um, and uh, some of my students, uh, in fact, uh, take a year or two years off after undergraduate because they've worked so hard. Yeah. They need to uh, get a breather. I didn't do that. Um, everybody's different, but I think the uh, balance, the maintaining the balance is, is very important. Staying active otherwise, uh, although my social life was ran the psych department, um, it, it was a social life. So, yeah. 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 It's super interesting that I think it's, um, especially lately, I think a lot of, a lot of people are now kind of switching to like, you you are going to graduate, you are going to finish your program, mm -hmm. don't be so much in a hurry, like make sure you balance or like don't get burned out. Um, and on those lines, I'm wondering like, how do you both partake in self-care? Like, what are some things you do to kind of like let go of the stress of the day? Hmm. Um. Well, I think, uh, so I can, I can go ahead. I just think of something. I've been think, spending a lot of time thinking about this recently, and I think learning self, good self-care habits is really um, kind of a, a, a lifelong pursuit in the sense that you'll, you'll constantly get better at it and you'll go through different phases of your life where you find it's easier and others where it's more difficult. One thing that has really worked for me is to really try and compartmentalize. I know it can be really easy to get online at 10 o'clock at night or when you're home you're relaxing to send emails and things like that. Um, and obviously you really want to prioritize your time. That's the most productive time, but the truth is compartmentalizing and making sure that relaxation time is relaxation time and work time is work time helps you feel rejuvenated in a yeah. sense. I don't feel like I worked um, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whereas I really had some actual time off. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I, I work long hours, but I try and make sure that the hours that I do take off truly are relaxation hours so that I do feel rejuvenated by the end of them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I like that. I like it a lot. And uh, um, I guess I tried to keep in mind the reasons I was getting involved in anything and that there is more to life than just my professional work. So, uh, um, I tried to keep in mind that there were things beyond psychology as I was working in psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and my own sense is that people appreciated that uh, more than I realized. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, for uh, one example is a remind myself there are other things in this world besides psychology so i go to apa and do work uh there and um but i always made sure to to go for a walk each day <laughs> i get out of the building yeah uh and um I, uh, when I had a family uh, i still have a family but i mean when i had a young family i uh go buy a little something for my son or my wife. So I had something else to think about and it reminded me there's more to life than uh, 
APA is very important, and I work with them a lot. I, I like that, but there is more. Right. Yeah, it's so uh, you're actually the second person I talked to this week um, during one of these sessions that really talked about almost scheduling your free time and like scheduling time with family um, and making sure you don't break appointments with yourself. And I was just like, that is so like things that they don't teach you, um, but really what helps like really maintain and like helps you thrive in the long term to be successful in the end. Um, and I know, John, you talked a little bit about conferences um, and APA. I'm wondering like what are key conferences you've been to and like why were they so influential? Oh, uh, uh, well, um, I'll take a step backward for just a second and then answer that. Um, I did want to say I uh, saw in the uh, monitor, um, one of the recent monitors, a reference to some research being done on work-life balance. Mm -hmm. So I looked it up, of course, and, and uh, among the key findings in this meta-analysis um, was that the perception of better work-life balance usually correlated with uh, uh, the perception of higher career advancement potential. Wow. Meaning if they see you as being more balanced, they thought, hey, you're going to make it and you're going to get ahead, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, I can tell you it's Journal of Applied Psychology, 2008 uh, article, uh, and it was me mentioned in the monitor. It wasn't my work. Uh, okay, so so, but I, I thought that was interesting. Oh yeah. Um, but but on to the conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, I go to APA fairly regularly uh, every year. You know, it, it is. Uh, it, it has evolved from a balance of science and practice to a little more practice but as some have said uh, there are a few conferences where you find all of psychology represented both science and practice and so among my more memorable papers that I heard was the uh, this person at UC San Francisco who was in on a research team who discovered this thing called telomeres. Huh. And they were shortened under stre with strat chronic yeah. stress. They were shortened. And of course, now it's at everybody's lexicon, but I heard it first there. Yeah. And so she may have been presenting it elsewhere. In fact, I'm pretty sure she was. But, uh, but I thought that was really a cool paper. In not in clinical or in community, but I was just walking around and thought, what the hell, it's a telomere. <laughs> you know, so I, I like APA because of the breadth of, of the uh, uh, options that can be offered. Uh, and, and besides, I get to see my friends and classmates and hang out, so that's good. Uh, uh, Right. Is, is that what you were looking for? Yeah, absolutely. Sally, how about you? Sure. In terms of conferences? Yeah. Um, I have two main conferences that I try and go to on a regular basis. So the first one is APA's annual convention. And then the second one is the annual convention of the National Association of School Psychologists. Mm -hmm. um, and so I try and go to, even if I go to additional conferences during the year, I try and go to both of those conferences fairly regularly. And that's because NASP. I just want to clarify, that's NASP. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's NASP. Yes. Okay. That's right. okay. Yeah. Um, so that's NASP. I try and go to both of them fairly regularly. A, because it's a great place to get professional development hours. Um, yeah. And so I really enjoy being able to do that. Um, and B, the more you go to the same conferences on, a, on an annual basis, the more you get to know the people there. And so sometimes I find when I go to a new conference, it's hard to connect with people immediately because they're so yeah. hard. Um, when you go to the same conferences every year, you start to see the same people every year. And so it actually facilitates, I think, a stronger connection with people that you are connecting yeah. with. Um, those two conferences, I think, are, are 
excellent in terms of getting the, the PD hours and then also finding people who just, you know, you can connect with in terms of your research interests. And I, I look forward to both of them every year. They're really great. Yeah, and I think especially, um, I'm, I can't really speak to NAS, but I'm sure they have some kind of uh, process as well. But I've also felt like as a student, APA can actually be very affordable um, because there's so many grants, there's so many travel awards, Division 45 has a ton of travel awards, um, but now you can volunteer at conferences, so usually they will lower your registration fee or get rid of your registration fee. Um, and like as a student level, kind of the same thing you were talking about, about connecting with friends or connecting with colleagues. Um, as students, that's where you could probably meet other students as well and kind of like form that network. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the travel awards I think is, is key. I've definitely applied to travel awards before because you only get limited funding through a university and yeah. um, it it's really makes a huge difference and it's something to put on your CV as well too. Oh, absolutely. What would you suggest for students who like maybe want to attend like either APA or NASP or like clinical psychology or community psychology uh, conference, um, but they don't have anything to present? In terms of the funding. Yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. So I can think of the one thing I can keep in mind, and I don't know how this works for students. I know that I've gotten funding from um, division too. And for example, they have funding for professional development in terms of teaching. Um, so if you're interested in building on your teaching skills, they have funding to, to seek the PD for that. Um, wow. I have to give it some thought. For, and I don't know if that applies to students. I know it's to early career professionals. Um, I, def I would definitely need to give that some thought. So John, I'm not sure if you have ideas about that. Um, well, I, I guess schools, the, uh, your school, uh, sometimes has funding. I know as uh, uh, undergraduate institution, we would uh, come up with many grants for students who were all they were presenting, though. But um, if there were it was extra money, you could always try to apply. I think uh, in graduate school as well, but but usually you do have to be uh, doing some presentation. Uh, most conferences do that, but, but schools, I'm trying to think elsewhere. If you're in a work setting, uh, sometimes there'll be some kind of travel money that could be uh, tapped into. Uh, yeah, but good, good question. That's a tough one. But I wouldn't be shy. I'd, I'd ask. I always uh, figure if you don't ask, you will never know. Oh, absolutely. And kind of on those lines, do you feel it's still important for students to go to an APA even if they weren't presenting? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think making the connections that Sally talked about is really important. And regularity, I think, also is very helpful. Um, my own sense is the students that seem to benefit the most um, uh, put aside their introversion and uh, um, uh, uh, meet people and they meet just about whoever they want. I don't know of very many uh, psychologists who will turn down somebody walking up to them and saying hello, yeah. especially if their research or their presentation is part of the comment. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, um, depending on which conference you're at, uh, most folks are uh, certainly willing to meet others and talk to people. And it's a great opportunity um, beyond the formal, uh, at the formal papers, certainly, but even beyond the formal, if you can figure the way to do that. But oh, yeah. It has to be a little... Yeah. <laughs> one thing, Desa, one thing I might add to it is just thinking if a student was saying to me that they weren't necessarily presenting, first of all, one of the, the huge benefits of attending a conference is being able to get that presentation experience. Yeah. And I think sometimes there are very creative ways to find, even if you don't have a very active research project going on that has data for you to be able to analyze in the here and now, there are all kinds of presentation topics that I think would be of interest. 
for example, if you are a member of a student group with Division 45, or even a member of a student group with D16, present on um, considerations for students, or um, pathways for early career professionals, or even yeah. professional issues, sometimes literature reviews even, um, if they're in an area that's novel or unique, can be something of interest to present. So if you connect with other people through the organizations, you can find common interests. A lot of times you can find a pathway to present. Um, the other thing I would suggest too is that regional conferences are a great way to get some presentation experience and then make the travel affordable. Um, I know I often recommend that my students do a first or initial presentation um, at the Eastern Psychological Association because that's often in three cities, you know, usually rotates between three cities that are very nearby and actually New York City is the next location so it's about oh, awesome. 40 Right. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes getting that initial experience at, at a regional conference or is, is just a great way to connect with people in the area who share your interests and um, just to you know, get, get your feet wet with that with those presentations and make it affordable. I, I, yeah. I like that think uh, thinking creatively with regards to ways you can present it doesn't have to be straight uh, experimental design research mm -hmm. and uh, just piggybacking on the uh, I have known folks who meet at one conference and plan for the next year. And so they then can either trade off and how to collect data or uh, strategize the kind of symposia they want to put together to uh, try to present. Uh, uh, and then otherwise, I'm, I, I am in this and say the regionals are excellent. Um, I was on the exec for Western Psych Association a few years ago. It's a very good um, uh, opportunity for students to present and get feedback on their work. Um, I think the regionals uh, in particular have, have really been uh, uh, working at getting uh, student involvement. And so, yeah, there, yeah I, I know that for sure. Yeah, thank you for transitioning to that because that was actually going to be my next question about like how students get involved and like um, how they can create possible research projects. So at least they feel like they're working on something or they can present on something. Um, and I'm wondering for the both of you, if a student feels like they're not so connected, um, how, how do they get the courage to go to a regional conference or how do they get connected with the regional conference even though maybe their department or their advisor isn't suggesting that stuff as much? Good question. Uh, I, I've, what I've observed is there's a strength in numbers. And so if there are students uh, as a group, um, to get connected and to uh, start talking to others. Uh, and so you don't have to be presenting to be in that group of people going, but uh, go with others who are going to be active. Uh, at, yeah. So what do you think, Sally? Um, one thing I sometimes my students will do is even if they're not necessarily involved in a lab, because sometimes there can be limited spots in a lab, and especially in my area, limited spots for undergrads too, because it's a predominantly graduate level area in terms of who participates in the research. But um, just even asking a faculty member to start with something like an independent study. Um, and with an independent study, you might be able to put together a really comprehensive literature review that gives you an idea of where you might want to go. Um, most institutions have some kind of independent study and you know you can work with a professor that you know you connect with in class, you think you have a good relationship with, ask them if you can do an independent study on this topic, put together a lit review and start conceptualizing some ideas for presentations and, um, and research projects in the future. But I think that's, a, that's an uh, easier way to sort of get your feet wet in terms of the research and see if you'd be interested. Yeah, that was such a great suggestion um, for both of you because I feel like um, I totally forgot that I did an independent study in my master's program. Um, I really wanted to learn about sports psychology and we just didn't have anything like that going on. Um, and I interned with a sports psychologist and it just opened my whole world to like what they actually did. Um, and it was just an easy way to get that experience but really figure out like if that was an area I wanted to go into. That's great. That's really great. 
yeah I like I told I was like oh I did that that's so like I totally forgot I should do another one so that I figure out my life but <laughs> that's another <laughs> webinar <laughs> I would say also um just encouraging students not to be shy about emailing professors mm -hmm. Um, we're always, I mean, at least if I speak for myself, and I know so many of my colleagues feel the same way, we're always looking for eager, motivated students to work with. Um, and so, you know, getting a, a nice, well-crafted email that has clear interests and clear ideas about what you want to do, I think, is something that is appreciated by a lot of faculty members. So students really shouldn't feel shy about doing these things. Yeah. It may not be the best semester. If it's not, we can say maybe next semester works better or whatever it is, but I would highly encourage that so yeah absolutely um and do you have that same like advice and encouragement for students like at conferences i know a lot of students are like nervous to like maybe approach you or approach john like um being like i sometimes i feel like i see people and i'm like oh my god that's like so and so and you just get so like starstruck <laughs> like <laughs> i just like i read your paper you're amazing <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody who does not like to hear that. <laughs> so uh, that would be a great opening. <laughs> but but uh, um, again, um, my own observation is uh, people are, uh, their conferences to talk with our, and so uh, I don't know if anybody who turns that down. Uh, at, uh, at Western Psych Association, uh, Phyllis Lombardo is usually there, and uh, um, is and, and students, of course, love him because of his uh, uh, teaching background, his work in intro, as, as well as his research uh, in social. So um, uh, they approach him, and he's, he's usually very uh, willing to talk to students about their work and their interests. Uh, um, yeah, so I, 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 I get out there. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> I, I would say also that for myself, um, I uh, found mentors by being at some of those conferences and walking up to folks I wanted to know and talking to them. And, and also understanding that um, for some folks, time is limited given the amount of work they have to produce at the uh, university or given the phase of their uh, career. Uh, but I was persistent. <laughs> so uh, I just kept at it until um, they finally said, okay, or something showed up where we had common interests. So um, uh, polite, structured, but I would be persistent uh, until it was clear they really, you know, they, there were no common interests. Maybe, maybe that's something. But, but that's how I got my mentors as I think of it. I think that's really good advice. <laughs> One thing I might add too, if students are afraid to approach faculty members who they don't have a connection to, um, one thing to do can sometimes be identify who your mentor and who your faculty advisor collaborates with um, oh. and, have your, and have your faculty advisor facilitate an introduction. Um, because I think there might be a, a natural pathway in terms of uh, the connection in terms of interest. And then it's just also easier to, to start a conversation when there, when there is a connection in general. So you might think about asking your advisor to do something like that. Yeah, that's an amazing suggestion. I didn't even think of something like that, especially because um, I think it's sometimes hard, especially for students of color, to feel like they can almost like ask someone or really anyone, even their advisor, to almost like introduce them or like um, they don't want to be those kind of people who just like name drop like, oh, I met so and so or things like that. And I think that what you said, not just about being persistent, but also being consistent with like what your needs are. Um, and I'm wondering for both of you, what's one piece of advice you, you would give a student who is looking for a mentor maybe outside of their university? Well, um, I, I reinforce Sally's point in that, as I recall, some of my mentors really, uh, when I moved to the Seattle area, were uh, folks 
who I was introduced to uh, from my uh, advisors or my network back east. Um, and so uh, I'm still in touch with a mentor who's a senior, senior at this point, um, all because uh, one of the deans I had worked with back in Rochester said, oh, give him my card and gave me his card and said, give him my card and call him up and, and uh, he's a good guy. And so uh, it really facilitated the, uh, the uh, access to those networks and in turn he introduced me to others. Um, so I, I, you have all the answers, Sally. I like that. It's it's a good one. That's very good. Yeah. Um. So I'm. Oh. Oh. I guess. So I guess my thought on mentors outside the institution is that a key thing to remember, and at least when I've read some research on mentorship, is that you not all mentors have to serve exactly the same purpose. Um, and so I think sometimes the tendency is to look for mentors who. Um, foster the research skills, which is really important, of course, but sometimes mentors can fill lots of other functions in terms of just helping facilitate professional connections, helping you get a sense of journal editorial work, um, helping you support your clinical skill development. And so, um, you know, when I'm thinking about mentors, and I, I, I've really had some fantastic ones in, in my past, so, but I think about how all of them have really contributed something different. Um, and I think it's important for you to think about your areas of need and what you're really looking for and recognize that a real strong network of mentors with different areas of expertise is, is probably a good thing. And sometimes looking outside of the university, it can be helpful to do that too, to look through organizations and think about the skills, not just research, um, but other skills you wanna develop and, and who might be good people to help you develop those skills. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. It, 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 uh, reminds me of, um, I, I did a video series on um, ethnic, elder ethnic minority psychologists a uh, ways back, and um, uh, a woman named Reiko True, who is in San Francisco, um, said, uh, it, it reminded me of something she had said, which is, get multiple mentors. There are lots of different areas of life in, uh, that you need mentoring in or could get advice in. Go out and get as many as you like or, or feel you need. Uh, and in particular for myself, I really saw it important to have mentors in the university so I know, uh, because you want to survive. And that's all there is to it. You need to know the ins and outs of your university. So mentors in the university, but also outside the university, because I always saw this as a profession that goes beyond the borders of the academia. Um, and so there were mentors at APA or in research areas outside of what I was doing at school. Uh, so, right, in, in the all in their own time contributed a lot to my decisions, you know, with regards to working in APA governance or not, stage of my career, whether or not I should be doing more research or publishing, who, and, and it also taps into their networks, which then gets really broad. I mean, and, um, there's a guy named Jen, uh, Grena Vetter who talked about the strength of loose ties. You want a network that is open. And the broader the, the network, the better because of the diversity it brings in terms of resources and opportunities. Uh, and, and that's what I've found. Uh, it helps. So what she said, it just yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm wondering for both of you, when did you transition from being a mentee to being a mentor? 
good question. I think John might be more prepared to answer that than I am because I feel I feel like both a mentee and a mentor at this point, and I definitely haven't transitioned out of being a mentee. So, <laughs> so John might be able to answer that one better than I can. Oh, I think his um, I think his internet is frozen, so it's actually your turn. Oh no, he's back. I hear him. John, can you hear us? Oh, I see it too. It looks like it's frozen. I thought I heard him for a minute, but. Uh, yeah, so, Sally? <laughs> okay, oh, I, hope, I really wanted to hear his answer to that, so. <laughs> I hope Hopefully that he'll come back. Yeah, he probably will sign back in. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, I would say I definitely haven't made the transition. I rely very strongly. I, I've had some really amazing and consistent mentors over time mm -hmm. in the university and outside of the university. Um, and I continue to rely on them for advice because the truth is, I never stop needing advice. I just start needing yeah. advice about different things. Yeah. <laughs> so when you become a professor, you have all new things to think about uh, from when oh, you were. Hey, work. welcome back. No, 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 thanks. Hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. Uh, um, yeah, so Sally was just an answering the transition from being a mentee to be a mentor. And we were yeah. waiting for your answer, but I, I made her go first. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, so like I was saying, I, I definitely haven't transitioned out of being a mentee yet. And I would encourage you really to hold on to it as long as you can. Because like I said, it's, it's not a matter of not needing mentorship anymore. It's a matter of needing mentorship in different things, in different areas. Um, I can't imagine a time where there won't be something that I don't have to learn, whether it's professionally or um, content specific, specific in terms of my research. And so I think the mentorship relationship evolves over time. Yeah. Um, you start to become more independent. But the truth is, I, I think I will always benefit from having mentors. And I don't plan to transition anytime soon. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so I just, you know, I've had to reconceptualize what that means for me, and it looks a little different now as a faculty member than it did as a student, but um, my mentorship relationships are still really, really valuable, valuable to me, so. Right, right, I, I agree in exact same way. Uh, I continue to have my mentors. In fact, I, I think we're going to have lunch right. next week. Um, the, uh, so I, I keep my mentors, and... Uh, I don't know if there is a transition from mentor to mentee. Uh, um, no, you know, even in retiring, <laughs> there are things to learn and things to do. I am in phased retirement, so I still am active in some ways. Uh, so um, it's just very helpful to have that. And a number of years ago, uh, it's not a term I devised, but I've heard it and I agree with it. There's something called horizontal mentorship. Mm -hmm. So uh, your peers and your colleagues uh, serve as mentors. And I think in the end, given I'm a community psychologist, a strong functioning community helps. It always helps. And I don't know when it stops helping. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And the literature on aging suggests you <laughs> want a good, you want to be integrated, you want to be involved. So, right. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I like that answer because the truth is, yeah, a lot of the advice and the mentoring I do does come from peers. And, mm -hmm. and it's really the same for graduate students, too. I remember some of the, the best mentors I had, too, in graduate school were when I was a first and second year doctoral student and I was Ooh. being mentored by third, fourth, and fifth year doctoral students yeah. or even just getting some professional advice from peers. I, think that's huge. I, like, I like that term, horizontal mentoring. Uh, uh, yeah, right. that makes a lot of sense. So uh, we're almost out of time, actually. And I first, I want to thank you so much for being flexible and all of the technical issues and things like that. Um, but where can we find you next? Like, what are you doing next? What conferences might you be at that students can come say hi? Uh, I hope to be at, uh, I will be at APA in San Francisco. There's a chance I'll be at WPA in Portland. Okay. Um, which is in April. Right. Um, I go to the 
NASP annual convention every single year, and I try to go to APA as well. Um, and when possible, I try and go to the Eastern Psychological Association. But if students aren't attending any of those meetings, I would encourage you, Desa, to just share my email address with whoever uh -huh. wants to talk, or even if they want to get on Zoom meeting or Skype or whatever wow. it is, I'm really happy to chat with them anytime. So it doesn't necessarily have to be at a, at a professional conference. So Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put it in the description for sure. Okay, great, great, good. Yeah. I look forward to it. I, I see Yuli seems to be on. Yep, um, Yue? Yeah, she just jumped out a little bit late. So, okay. um, but we're actually wrapping up, and so her okay. and I will probably touch base. Um, okay. Again, thank you so much for being flexible. You were both amazing. Thank you so much for all of your advice and just being so kind and uh, affirming to grad students in Division 45. We really do appreciate it. I might suggest. I mean, it's yeah, it's value, of course, but um, I like this three way and maybe <laughs> three way, uh, yeah. or more. Uh, I'm happy to do a, a. I know there's this. Well, it's your second meeting, though, Sally, isn't it? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I'm scheduled for next week, but uh, I'm happy to do a multiple again. This has been. Uh, I think a lot more enjoyable in that okay. uh, lots of interaction and input. And yeah. I love the P and the retired uh, <laughs> uh, different <laughs> perspective. That's good. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. That's amazing feedback. And I think that's something we may do in the future um, just because this actually worked out really well. But I think it's also a testament of how flexible you both are. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, when we talk to other mentors. So hopefully you will both be willing to mentor again in the future. I know, uh, John, you have another meeting coming up, but even for you, Sally, if you're free, we would love to have you again. Please contact, yeah. So the, the following weekend, I'm going to be out of town, but honestly, anytime. Oh, wow. I, I'd love to really get on. I usually am not too scheduled on Saturday. So okay. uh, yeah, so just, just let me know. And John, I want you to mentor me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. Sure, <laughs> <not a> <laughs> yeah. e email him. Don't be shy. Email him. <laughs> Don't trade emails. This is That's great. Right. Say hi at APA. Right. I do right. like APA. APA. Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. You guys have a great weekend and just enjoy your Saturday, okay? Thank okay, you. Thank you too. Thanks Bye, so much. Man. Bye.